This is the Websites.ca podcast, where we help Canadian small businesses build and maintain an effective website and online presence. Hello again, Websites.ca podcast listeners. Sean Corbett here, Websites.ca marketing. Today, we're joined with one of my favorite past guests and my very good friend, Ross Mann. He's an entrepreneur. He heads the consultant agency, Solid Solutions, and he's also the inventor of one of the key geological apps, Formation Finder. Uh, We're not going to talk about startups and we're not going to talk about websites today. We're actually going to go a little bit offline, but you can tie that into your online efforts for sure. And we're going to talk about conferences and trade shows, which Ross I think you have a, a ton of um, experience in, is that right? Yeah, I've uh, put them together and I've also attended plenty. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here. And yeah, I guess let's just jump right into it. So I will ask you at some point, you know, some of your history with conferences and trade shows, but I wanted to start from a different angle, which is, you know, if we have listeners and they have industry trade shows, I think it's rather obvious, right? They'll probably be considering or have attended industry trade shows. But for all the other listeners, for all the other brick and mortar businesses out there, can you maybe run us through some of the main benefits of attending a trade show or conference? And then also on the flip side, who would a trade show conference not be for? What kind of business would not benefit from them? Well, um, the most benefit I've found in the past when I've attended them is uh, obviously networking. Um, is, and maybe I should back up. There's a few ways to attend uh, a conference, right? You can be a uh, attendee where you buy a ticket or a pass or whatever, and you go there and they have uh, breakout rooms where they teach you some things. They have keynote speakers where you talk, uh, listen to the keynote speaker, and you go to the trade show uh, and people try to sell you stuff. Uh, when I've done that, I've found it valuable from a networking point of view and um, meeting other other people seeing what they're doing seeing kind of uh the the people that have done it very well people that are just starting out seeing where you fit and having a lot of discussion uh, especially out of the conference is very valuable so like after hours there's usually something going on sometimes um, people put on parties or breakout sessions after the show or just hanging out at the local area and there's a lot of attendees still there so networking camaraderie um, getting questions answered from other people. And then obviously the trade show, when you're an attendee, you can find out problem solving answers, if you will, like people that have built products and software for you or, or, uh, processes or whatever that can help streamline your business. Uh, but for me, it's always been, uh, networking. And, uh, the, the other aspect would be being part of the trade show. So being a vendor in the trade show. And I've also was a speaker as well, and there's benefits to that. But uh, being part of the trade show is where I found the, the most success. Um, the, the benefit there is that, one, you get the flip side of everything I just said. So people come to you with problems that you might be able to solve. Um, they come with you with problems that you might have not have thought of before, and that might help add new product lines or new ways of thinking about your own business. And um, one thing that was very viable in the case of Formation Finder, uh, we realized that we could create strategic partnerships with other vendors at the uh, at the trade show. So not only were we selling to the to the attendees, but we realized quickly that the people in the trade show, other vendors could become sponsors of ours or strategic partners where they can enhance our product or vice versa. We can enhance their product. Uh, and that was all very valuable. And in the case of uh, being a vendor, there's downtime, a lot of downtime while people are in the, the breakout sessions. So you get a chance to chat with them and um, discuss with them what they're doing and everything like that. So my my group and I, uh, we always utilize that downtime and kind of basically sell or network to the uh, other vendors. And it paid off quite well, that's for sure. So a lot of that sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of that sounds like B2B and not very much B2C. Is that right? Yeah, it's been most successful for me, uh, B2B. Uh, B2C is a lot harder. So if you're a business selling to generally everyone, 
uh, even if it is kind of niche, but the population is quite large or obviously quite large, a lot of people don't go to conferences generally. There yeah. are there are conferences like a, a good friend of mine runs uh, comic book conventions, and that's a B to C uh, kind of situation, right? But with with his business, um, he's been very successful. Mm -hmm. The attraction is the the entertainment side. The he cele had. yeah, the celebrities are bringing people in. So you yeah, you'd want to leverage celebrity or mass market appeal in a, in a very unique way to to pull that off, right? Yeah, and if you're in that type of business, that's just a whole other ball game. It's it's kind of like a kind of like an amusement park onto itself, not so much like a networking business selling, but you're selling the uh, the approach or the access to those people um, individually rather than say a movie. So it kind of doesn't fit the model that I'm used to. But um, in that business, it's the 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 speakers are the product. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that that might that might be on a scope for this conversation. Yeah. We might want to keep it focused on the on the B two B then in that case because yeah. that's a good yeah. that's a good point. Well, the, the my point was that the on the retail side, the average Joe is not um, gunning to go to a conference for average things, right? They're not going to go and to a couch conference because they love sitting on the couch or a TV conference because they love watching TV. They're users of those products, but they're not going to those conferences, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so yeah, it would probably be out of scope. But that's that's the point is that uh, if you're selling like that, conferences may not be a way to reach your your customer. But um, going to conferences could be a way to improve the the backside of your business. So yeah. if you are someone that sells TVs, let's say, you could learn how better sales techniques, uh, other people that are in the industry providing products that could improve your business and so on. Or you could be, you know, uh, you could have a wholesale wing of your business, right? So you're doing the wholesale stuff at a conference, yeah. looking for a distributor or vice versa, a distributor looking for a wholesaler, that kind of thing. Yeah, you go to a conference for your product and uh, the audience members are wholesalers. Kind of, one of the big ones around here is um, franchise conferences. So a lot of people want to start their own franchise business. So the, the average deal that goes there are people that want to buy a franchise similar to the wholesale kind of concept. So it's not your your retailer, it's more of an insider kind of game. Got it. Yeah. So you and I have a mutual friend, I won't I won't say who it is on the podcast, but uh we were discussing doing like consulting with him to attend maybe some conferences in 2023 and one of the first things he said was uh he's up for it but he doesn't want to buy a booth. And then he said I said why and he said, oh, no one visits booths at conferences or trade shows. And you and I had a good laugh about that. So for, for the next section of this talk, let's just cover what are the big mistakes or misconceptions people have about it when, when they attend? What are the mistakes they make when they attend? And what are the misconceptions they have about um, what works and what doesn't at trade shows and conferences? So as a person that's put on the, the, the booth, and been in the trade show and also set up trade shows. Um, most people are boring. They don't seem to understand that, that they're there to sell their product and that the person that's going to the conference doesn't necessarily want to go to the trade show. Like I, I've just at the beginning said that it's, there's value there, but most people think that they're going to be sold. And at the front of people's heads, they don't want to be sold, even though we know deep in the back of their head they do. Um, so you kind of have to make yourself stand out. So the biggest mistake I've seen is one, they set up a standard booth. Uh, you can buy booth products, like just like you can buy any type of advertising with the little, um, uh, things that pull out and they have like a, a random table and a backdrop and chairs and, and they sit behind the, 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 the desk blocking the backdrop and, uh, they're playing with their phones. And they're waiting for the the customer or the attendee to get their attention to talk about their product, and uh, it's it's quite prevalent. I've seen a lot of people do it, and um, that's the biggest mistake because if they're if the attendee attendee's not going to go out of their way to talk to you, you kind of, they don't may not even see you, they may not even know what you're selling. You kind of look the same as everyone else, especially if you're not flashy or have a special looking booth. Now I have seen recently that that's kind of changing. Uh, that some booths are now becoming more and more interactive. Uh, but it definitely 10 years ago, it was not. And even maybe even three years ago, it was not. And you still see the people standing behind the booth. So what we've always done is, uh, especially in Formation Finder, my business partner and I, um, 
thought of ourselves as carnies, uh, like carnival barkers. So like it wasn't enough just to set up a booth hope people came. Our mission was to talk to everybody. And so we'd set up an interactive booth. And I'm not just talking like a computer that people play with, but like the actual props of the booth are interactive. They can touch our booth. They can pull things, put things on, interact with them, interact with us. And then we had a desk for the computers because it was software based. So we had to have a computer, but we stood in front of it. And as people walk by, we would pull them in, not physically, but like talk to them. It's great. Everyone has a name tag, right? So you can say, Hey Jim, how's it going at company or place location whatever and that usually will get their attention and then uh, you can have just a conversation with them uh in in case of formation finder we're doing juggling because we had uh pins kind of part of our product was pinning stuff on on a chart digital chart so we made actual like giant uh pins that we we would juggle with my partner back and forth i hand the pin to people so they can hold it while we talk to them just giving them something to hold on to, like change the perception of what they're receiving. So that was good. So yeah, I kind of talked about the benefits and, and uh, drawbacks, but uh, the biggest flaw is people not engaging with their customers like anything else. They're just sitting back hoping customers will come to them. Yeah, the, the image I'd want to put in the brain of the listeners is that there's a flow of human beings, right? You have a hallway, let's say, and booths on either side. And the flow of people that you want to reach is in the middle. So when you, what Ross is saying, what you're saying, obviously, is when you sit behind, you sit behind, you're like, you're, you're putting now a border in front of you and the people you want to reach. So simply getting in the, your brain that you can come around the other side and get into the flow of traffic. And then, like you said, the great opener that most people have, a, and in most trade shows have a name tag or, or some kind of business iconography. Um, but yeah, that, that image of the carny bark was perfect because I don't know if our listeners listening, like we grew up in Alberta. So you had Stampede and I was up in Edmonton. We had Klondike days. And if you think about that, right, there's those like shoot a pistol, throw it ring on a bottle top, whatever. But those guys who manned those booths that would always come out into the thoroughfare, have a pitch of some kind that would attract you as a kid, then go back behind their booth, get you to do the interactive thing. Yeah, I, I've taken my own advice very literally. So I've stood in the middle, the very middle center of the hallway between booths and talk to people as they it, I conceptualize as a rock in, in, a, in a river and that water had to flow over me. And uh, I, I talked to people. And in that particular case, I wasn't the main person to talk to. So my goal was, and, and most people that did do the talking were kind of doing it the old way. So, and I couldn't change much of it, but I was there, I was there to sell. So my thought was that the only thing I can do is reposition myself. So I put myself in the middle, a literal middle of the hallway of where we were in the in the conference center and people washed past me and I would pick them off, talk to them, open them whatever way I can, and then push them into, uh, again, not physically, but like uh, sell them into going to talk to the main, main person. So go over yeah. here, talk. To, oh, that's an interesting idea. Go talk to so-and-so. Uh, and then so I eliminated the barrier that that person has set up with the, with the table by creating a an opener and then and then making a connection that that uh, attendee now is willing to cross that barrier because I've, I've kind of given them permission to do so. It's psychologically yeah. also a mini venue change because you're taking them from That's the motion cool. of the hallway back behind the booth. So it does build very quickly, build some quick rapport. And it, it could be like, yeah, a venue change is a good idea. You, you could actually lean into that and create a more intimate booth. So going the opposite of what I just said and rather big interactive, you create intimate. So like uh, two chairs, like an interview style, yeah. sit down with you and you talk, especially in the consulting business, which I, I have experience in. So I grab them in the, in, in the thoroughfare and then venue change them into the more intimate uh, booth setting where they can have a one-on-one talk with the, the principal of the company. Like I've seen that kind of work. Uh, you could definitely expand that. And I have, I don't really see that a lot of people doing that. There, people are going around doing the big flashy now, which is cool. But, you know, to get a bang for your buck, you want to stand out and you could uh, literally stand out in the open and then create an intimate situation to do a sales. Yeah, I love that. My marketing mentor says, yeah, in an age of social media where everyone has access to everyone 24 seven, the differentiator is to make yourself hard to access. So just by the way you, you described setting up the booth, if you want to go in that direction, right? You close it off. You maybe even create a little waiting list 
like chairs where people have to wait to talk to the principal and you're going to look completely different from all the rest of the booths. But like you said, that only really works is if you have a, a team scenario where one person is going willing to go out and flag people down. Um, and then another thing, so all that stuff is great. I think one time you and I debriefed after you went to a conference, if, if you remember this and, uh, what you told to me is when the day started, you just like everybody else did not want to get up and sell, didn't want to have to put in the effort, didn't want to have to go and grab people and, and do the performative nature of things. Uh, but you did it, whereas everyone else convinced themselves to sit on their cell phones. But then you told me after about 30 minutes of that, it totally energized you and it changed your whole outlook on the day. And by the end of the day, you were exhilarated and had a great time. So sometimes people just need to actually get out of their own way and get over that mental hurdle too, right? Yeah, it's like anything. It's it's kind of like an inertia scenario, like uh, getting over the hump, getting out of bed, bed's comfy. Once you get going or like starting a workout or something, a run, once you get going, it's not so bad. You just got to get, like I said, over yourself, over your hangups and just get out there. And people actually do want to chat with you. Uh, I rarely get blow offs and stuff. So when people chat with me about what I'm selling and my products or, or my uh, my consulting products, like who I'm consulting with and stuff, um feels really good feels cool to talk to people about your stuff and yeah, that is very energizing and uh, at the end I'm, I'm jazzed and i'm pumped and i don't want to stop and at conferences like i said there's a lot of after things going on so i'll roll into that and keep going um but <laughs> at the end it's uh like any high energy high physical thing uh you then uh, I feel exhausted afterwards. You got to like, uh, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> well, that's why you partner up with a couple extroverts, right? And then they, yeah, I have they, uh, I've been most successful with extroverts to be able to, cause they love it. They feed off that. I'm the opposite. I, I love to do it, but I don't feed off of it long term. It's kind of a, a put on for me. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So you did sort of touch on this, but it's a question that I wrote down. Uh, we can expand on it. Maybe you can give me some specific examples or something that the audience could take away and try. But my question essentially was talk about booth management from the point of view of performance. So you use the word carny, right? But when we went into this talk, I thought of like, if you're going to a conference, you have to think of yourself as a performer. The whole thing is a performative act. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, do you have any specific examples? You kind of mentioned the pins and stuff like that. If you want to go into things that worked well for you in the past. Well, on the, on the booth setup, you know, colors, layout, the the standard stuff, um, entrance, like we're just talking about, if it's intimate, like how you would arrange that. Um, I've found that no matter what, having something handy, literally in your hand, that's generic enough that almost anyone can receive it, um, is a great part of the opener. So, hey, Jim, and as you're talking to Jim and asking them how they are at so-and-so, you're, you're extending your hand out with a pamphlet or a knickknack or something that they will 100% take. They don't know what, but when you give it to someone, if you give things to people, if you offer something to people, if there's not clearly something that they don't want, like something crazy, but if it's a, a, a simple and it's at a conference, like a pamphlet, knickknack or something, they're going to look at you. They're wondering why you know their name. They ne- people never seem to know why I know their name, even though it's right on there. Sometimes I've even made jokes about how I know their name because they clearly don't understand why I know their name. Uh, but I'm handing them something and they're taking it. And that whole mm. action is a, a series of small yeses like you and I talk about, right? They've they've looked at me. They've acknowledged that I've said their name. So that's a little bit of a, an acceptance. And then yeah. they've taken something from me and then uh once i get into that conversation like i don't care what it is sometimes it's the thing i'm giving them that they they actually do want to talk about but it has to be generic enough that it's some sort of value could it it just be sorry to interrupt you but could it be a mini branded water bottle let's say like just a gift just a just a sample to give yeah anything that could just that that could be a little expensive okay Uh, like a nice card stock cheat sheet of whatever. Like I've seen a lot of success with the cheats, cheat sheets. Okay. So with yeah, so, so not right a there. business card, but like some kind of fascinator, basically. Business cards don't move the needle anymore. Everyone like because of those yeah. uh, cheap ones, right? They don't anyone can get them. I've actually had people hand me really expensive business cards, metal in one case. So I was like, and that was a conversational starter for sure. I'm like, whoa, why why you spend this type of money on your business card, right? 
yeah. so you could do business card you just you gotta do it out of the normal everyone get the the cheap ones that feel like uh like plastic or whatever um so you you, you do want it cheap but you want it out of the ordinary and you want to have some sort of immediate perceived value so i find uh, with formation footer it was a pin it was very physical and they handed it back but it was the action and it was very on brand for us uh like we took um this is this grabbed the audience. So we, we took a towel rack, uh, cut off the ends and make it a little bit shorter. And then we put we were spray painted red a round hockey ball and put it on the end. So it looked like a pin that you put on a map, but in real life. And we'd hand that to people. Because again, uh, these were these were like uh surveyor types and so on that would have used your software to search for geological formations on a map. Yeah, and you know, pins on maps are not you know a stretch of concept like there you see them all over the place they're on the physical world that people put pin on the map and then like google maps and stuff they're putting digital pins on maps so it wasn't a stretch and people clearly when they came to our booth they clearly understood what was going on and we'd make them hold it while we gave them everything all the information and stuff like that so in, in terms of to get back to the layout uh as i'm handing it to someone and i'm conversing with them and figuring out what they need another nice display of additional pamphlets uh, that I can reach to and then hand it to them once I've narrowed down. I'm, I'm doing the action in the office. You can't see me. Like I'm, I'm physically reaching behind myself because I haven't memorized where things are at the, on the booth desk. And I grab the one they're talking about and say, oh, well, and then I start showing them what's on the pamphlet and we start talking about that. And so you, have a, if, you have a second thing, like an upgrade thing to hand them once you've segmented them. Yes, exactly. Once I figure out their segment, I can give them something of even more value. And that might be it. Like they might be busy. They're like, okay, then they walk away. Uh, but if they show even more interest in it, then yeah. I can bring them further into the booth physically and show them more items. So if you have uh, um, uh, some like product that they can actually touch and feel, that again, that's a good idea. If they, like in the case of Formation Finder, we try and get them to start using the product online at our booth. Uh, in some cases, people have studies or reports or examples. Uh, they can start doing uh, playing with that or looking pre 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 uh, previewing that in the physical world. Like, say, if you're a dentist, uh, you know, I haven't done any dental ones, but maybe if you're selling tools to dentists. You have some mock-up tools that they can start playing with. And part of this too is to to figure out where their problems are, what what problem you're solving, uh, and bringing them deeper, deeper into your your layout. And then if you do have the, where they need to talk to a different person, what you're also doing is you're buying time. So if that person's talking to one person and not the person you've just kind of yeah. brought into the ecosystem, you need things around you to discuss it by time while they wait. Uh, and then you can, you can usher them into the, the, the orbit of the principal. Um, or in some cases, um, if you know the principal's talking to someone about the same stuff and it's not like an intimate setting that we just discussed, mm -hmm. you could try and interject them into that conversation. And now you're right. So a group could be circled around the second right. person listening yeah, to them simultaneously. Okay. So there's an aspect at play here that's very similar to a high end restaurant where you want people to feel uh, the luxurious experience, love that's unique, whatever, but also you got to move, turn around tables too, right? Like okay. the second person has to be aware that they can't have an hour long conversation with their favorite guy at the conference because you're going to be sending them more guys every couple of minutes. Yeah. And that actually kind of ties into when you said that a lot of people that uh, have done booths with don't understand that they need to get up and sell and move. Uh, same with um, the, the principal or the knowledge holder or the industry expert. Some of those people really love what they do and they really want to talk to a client and they love to talk. So they have way too long of a conversation. So a, in the in case of formation finder, we we had this dialed in as well. The industry expert also needs to be skilled in what's going on and understand what's going on. They need to have a better conversation than what I've had with them, or if it's me or whatever, vice versa. Um, but understand that there's a time constraint. So they got to give them the information, make the connection, and then move them on. And and the fact that this conference is other people to see. There's uh, breakout rooms, keynote speakers, all these things going on. There's actually an easy out. Hey, you know, uh, it's great chatting with you, uh, Jim. I know conferences can be super busy. So again, uh, feel free to reach out to me when you're done. Uh, if I don't hear from you, I'll reach out to you. But uh, there's, there's a great vendor around the street, uh, around the corner. Uh, like I said, we've, we formed strategic partners. So we had no problem teeing them up with the next, next birth that was our partner. 
uh, even if we made that kind of arrangement on the spot, like, oh, hey, you guys are really cool. We're not competitors. I'm going to send people over to you after I'm done with them. Uh, okay, I didn't get what you meant right away, but that's awesome. So you, you get to the conference <clears throat> day one, hour one, excuse me, and then you say uh, whatever, right? Let's say you know them ahead of time. You go, you guys have a booth. We have a booth. Uh, we'll just make an agreement. We'll suggest to every person at the end of their time with us that they go see you next and you do the same for us. And that's just a, a nice, easy way to ensure you get more traffic. Is that basically what you're saying? If they can send it back to us, that, that's cool. But usually... I'm a better booth anyway. It's not coming to me first. Okay. So um, the people just don't get it. Even the, there was one that was great. They were, I ended up actually being one of our sponsors. They were buying advertising from us after this conference, but they had a margarita machine. And so they were giving people free margaritas. I don't know if there's alcohol in it or not. I don't know. I didn't really ask, but they had like a slurpy margarita thing. And that was their interact with let's get everyone going. Nice. And people were, our booth was so much more colorful. Uh, my partner and I were so much more dynamic. And the product that we had is something they really wanted to use that they were blowing by that margarita machine. But I love the fact that that margarita machine was there because I could have the conversation with someone and say, hey, have you had the margaritas yet? And they're like, no, I haven't. Oh, cool. We'll go have a margarita. I'll, I'll, I'll email you tomorrow. And it was an out. Okay, right, right. And then, so yeah, so you get your out to move them along. But then also you get a great relationship with those people who ended up right. in advertising. Okay, cool. And so so then, then that from us, the idea was that, hey, I can send traffic to you in a physical world. What are you yeah, doing? yeah. No, for sure. Um, and it, like you said, it, it's two birds with one stone because you do have to move the people along at some point. So sure. that that leads to my one of my final questions, which is essentially, I mean, we have to remind the listeners like we always do for any endeavor that we do. You have to have some kind of call to action at the end, right? You're, 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 you want to get something. Um, in your case with Formation Finder, I assume maybe you could sign them up with for an account on the spot. And yeah. maybe you can talk about that. But I would say like you have to grab, you got to get some kind of contact details at the end of the interaction, right? Either an email or phone number or both. Yeah. In the case of Formation Finder, we could sign them up. Formation Finder had a front-facing free product. So our goal, at least in the, the initial conferences, was that we needed to see a significant uptick in the free user base, which we did after the conference. So you could see as we were using the conference that go up, but if if there was some sort of seed change increase over over time after that, then we would we considered success. Once we had like a premium module where we could sell to people and they could sign up, then yeah, we could send them up on the spot, and that that did work. Um, making a connection, uh, grabbing their contact information, writing down. This is something I learned in politics is writing down what you talk to them about so you can have a very appropriate, very targeted follow-up, personalized follow-up. I've seen it done in the most boneheaded ways in, in other conferences that I've worked for and worked with um, that people just grab cards. Well, let me grab your card. And sometimes they'll throw it in a giveaway and have the giveaway items in a draw and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. at the end, they have these giant fish bowls or buckets or whatever of disjointed contact information. Oh, who did you talk to Sally? Or why did you talk to Sally? I don't know. Did Sally talk to anyone? Did they did they just throw it in themselves? Uh, did what's well, going on to Sally? Like you have no context. Mm -hmm. And if you're giving away, I've never given anything away, um, by the way, um, because people just throw it, stuff in to give away. So it destroys the context of your, of your lead generation. Uh, so, so would you maybe say like, if you give me your address, your business address, I'll send you a whole follow-up package in a week. Would that be, that's better because then you get the address and they take it more seriously because they don't just, I think like what you're describing is when you get uh, up to your hotel room at the end of the night from a conference, you have a handful of crap, you dump it on the, if there's two beds there, you dump it on the other bed, then you fall asleep and throw it all away in the morning, right? Yeah, and from the, and from the vendor side, uh, from the person working the trade show, I just have a bunch of cards that everyone put in because they want to win a bottle of wine or something like that. And I don't have any context. So right, right. If, depending on your product, you ask for what you can get, you write it down. Um, I, if I don't have something I can like give them, although you and I have discussed type of like sign up packages or, or thank, thank you packages, which I probably try to implement if I was to do this again. Um, but I always went with the ultra personal. So I would, remember what their name was, write down almost immediately why I was talking to them, like a paragraph of, of notes. This They're from 
this place. They like this stuff. They have a wife, they have a daughter, they have a son, they have a dog, whatever. Um, and I can create a dossier in, in uh, the client management system and then send them a very personalized email or very per- or call them up or something. Um, even with Formation Finder, with the public side, we always, um, like, because it's public, there's a lot of people, and it's free, a lot of people could sign up. And so you would think that we wouldn't want to have a personalized touch, but to get to critical mass with that, I took every single person uh, as individually personalized as possible, because I figured if I could talk to one guy at one company, you'd probably get everyone in his department on board. So um, I took the extra effort to take them out for coffees or talk to them and all this stuff. But you need better contextual information um, as the takeaway. Now, if you had a call to action, uh, you give them homework, which would be, could be cool. You uh, you ask them for something, like you said, to send them a thank you package or a sign up package. Uh, imagine if you were an attendee, then you got all the junk, like you said, you throw it on the, on the second bed, forget it. You throw it out because you can't fit in the plane, like you're going to carry on or something later. Yeah. Uh, but imagine if a book showed up at your house when you got home on the topic that you guys were discussing. Yeah. Something yeah, like yeah. that. That'd be wild. You That'd be awesome. Stay yeah. out, right. So, uh, yeah. So the call to action could be just to reconnect again. And if you're doing it right, they're going to want to reconnect again. If you're cold, non-energetic, disinterested in actually getting their business, don't care, want to work volume. Uh, it's just like anything else in sales. If you don't actually understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it's a important to your attendee uh you're you're not going to get success from it no for sure that makes sense and just to double back for a sec within your framework right of of the what we described the the rocket in the river grabbing the people leading them to the booth handing them off to a higher level principal who's got to give them a little more value and it's all organized um who's the person who would be tasked with keeping the contextual notes if it's done right, the principal, because they need to follow up. And it doesn't even, I, I like writing paragraphs, but uh, uh, in the case of some of our mutual clients and friends, if it's just enough to have uh, a reminder of what you talked about, because some people have good memories about conversations, right? Yeah. So it's like, oh yeah, uh, Jim with the purple shirt. Oh yeah, I remember, now I remember Jim with the purple shirt. I'm going to write this giant email to him, right? So yeah. it could be as simple as that. But the, the person that's having an intimate conversation needs to write it down because they have the intimate details. Uh, and I've, again, when people aren't selling well enough or they're not collecting that at the end well enough, I get upset because like, why are we here? Right. You, you're not there just to shake a bunch of hats. And it's like, it's, it's similar from a billboard versus an interview. Uh, yeah. if you want to just put up a billboard and blow through people, you could do that, but the conference doesn't have to be that way. No. Yeah. So just to make the audience aware, basically within the framework we talked about or the structure, they, they would have to also understand that the, the, the let's call them the setup guy, the setup guy has got to give the principal enough time after each interaction too, right. And not immediately interrupt their chain of thought or their chance to write down the notes by bringing the next person in. So there's a bit of an elegance and, a, and like it's, or, it's orchestrated. Essentially every step is orchestrated is what I'm getting from our talk today. Your team and you got, it, it doesn't work when you have someone like me out there uh, setting everyone up and then someone in the background, not knowing why they're getting set up a bunch of people and not knowing what to do with this. You got to communicate with that. And it works best if the team members around you understand that that's the goal and understand what to do for their role. Then you have a lot of success and it could be as simple as just communicating with them that that's that's what you're supposed to do. And hopefully people around you are willing to do that. If you are the principal, then you can select the team that was willing to do that for you. Perfect. Well, yeah, that, that about wraps it up. Last thoughts on this, Ross? Conferences are expensive. Uh, build it and they will come doesn't exist in many things. And conferences is one of those things. If setting up a booth and spending all that money and not doing it right would be absolute insanity. You should do it right. You should think about it. Think about your audience. Think about what they want to see. Think about how they want to be spoken to. Think about the call to action, the follow-up. Put thought into it. You're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a booth. You got to put equal amount of brain power into your approach while working that booth. Awesome, man. I, I always get so many ideas talking to you. So I really appreciate you, com- you coming on today. Hey, cool. If you're not satisfied with your current website or the service you get from your provider, you can switch to websites.ca for free and get a great support team behind you. 
Just visit websites.ca or email Ryan directly at ryan at websites.ca. Thanks for listening, guys. Catch you next time.